In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. The former New Jersey Governor, Chris Christie, said on Monday that the US should push ahead with reopening, uh, reopening its economy during the coronavirus pandemic because there are going to be deaths no matter what we do. He compared uh, these deaths to uh, the losses during World War I and World War II, uh, saying it's a sacrifice that Americans must make for their way of life. He went on to say that the American people have gone through significant death before. We've gone through it in World War I and World War II. We're going through it and we will survive it. We sacrifice those lives. Now, fortunately, we haven't heard too much of that kind of talk in Australia. You might remember there was a little bit at the beginning, wasn't there? Uh, especially about uh, older people, uh, that we might sacrifice those older people's lives uh, for, uh, for the sake of our economy. There hasn't been much of that talk, but you don't have to scratch our psyche too deeply to find that willingness to sacrifice others uh, for what is considered to be the greater good. <clears throat> uh, there is a memorial out the front of St Mary's Church. If we drive down the driveway, you look over to your left, you'll see uh, a big Celtic cross. Uh, that memorial turns 100 years old this year. Back in 1920, the Rector of Gosford, then the Reverend Arthur Rennick, wanted to honour the local men who had paid what was then called the Supreme Sacrifice during the First World War. He wrote to the families of these young men seeking permission to put their names on the new Gosford Cenotaph. We still actually have the letters of the mothers who wrote back to Arthur Rennick 100 years ago. And even after 100 years, you can feel the grief of these mothers uh, ooze out of this faded paper. For these mothers, child sacrifice was not just something that happened in the ancient world. It was something that was an ever present reality in their lives. Now there is an argument that these young men, many of them barely 18, in reality still children, gave up their lives for what we then called a just war. I remember vividly walking through a war cemetery just outside Heidelberg in Germany and this war cemetery went for acres and acres and acres. And the average age of the, these young men was 17. Children had been sacrificed for the war effort uh, right across the world. But I'm really quite interested in exploring the domination system of such a, a coercive power that it could cause young people to go off cheerfully and their families to give them permission and even support them to do this, go off cheerfully to their deaths, actually encourage them to do so. What a coercive culture uh, that would create that kind, of, uh, that kind of psyche. What a coercive domination system that would uh, uh, cause people to do that and be utterly vilified and, uh, and rejected and ostracised if they didn't. The story of Abraham's willingness to sacrifice his son Isaac is so barbaric in our hearing that we are tempted to avoid the story. That's why I wanted to explore it today. We apologise to parents for even telling the story in the hearing of children. I can remember as a, a Sunday school kid uh, colouring in this picture uh, of this, uh, uh, this, this child sort of laying back with his beatific look on his face with, the, with Abraham leaning over him with a knife raised. What a barbaric story to tell children. But it is an essential story to tell, an essential story to hear, 
and an essential story to understand. The story is perhaps 4,000 years old, maybe even older. And yet, like so many of the ancient Near Eastern myths, we can still hear the echoing down through the millennia of the ethical dilemmas that they are grappling with and questioning. And they are the same ethical dilemmas 4,000 years later that we still grapple with and question today. The story comes from a time when, when child sacrifice was most certainly part of the cultural reality and daily lives of the people. Yet the story tells us that the overwhelming cultural imperatives that drove parents to allow the sacrifice of their children were actually questioned and resisted and even overcome. Those cultural imperatives being transformed for a time into something less devastating before eventually being eliminated altogether. <clears throat> to fully appreciate and benefit from the, this truth, we must first understand that the biblical narrative, that long biblical narrative that comes together over thousands of years, is in fact a, a cobbled together, non-lineal but progressive story. The story of the evolution of the human understanding of God in the context of a social development. The Bible is the most peer-reviewed, comprehensive, longitudinal study of the human condition ever published. And therein lies just one of the, the many reasons for its incalculable value. Abraham is driven by a divine imperative to sacrifice his son. But before we judge Abraham too harshly, we must first reflect on what gods drive us. Whether they be some, uh, some remote ancient deities, whether they be a socio-political domination system or the various manifestations of the free market economy, they all demand the sacrifice of others usually the marginalised and the vulnerable and the voiceless. The story of the sacrifice of Isaac is not only a direct challenge to the socio-economic cultural domination system of the time, but it's a direct challenge to the very concept of God. In the narrative... Even the name of God changes from the beginning to the end of this story. Uh, even the very name of God, the way God is described and understood, is challenged in this story. It is the old idea, the old idea of God. Uh, God given the name of Elohim, who begins the story, who calls for this sacrifice to take place. But by the time we get to the end of the story, not only the concept, the idea of God has changed, but even the name of God has changed. While it is Elohim who calls for the sacrifice, it is Yahweh who stays the hand of Abraham and provides a lamb to replace the son. Can you imagine... Uh, how Abraham's society, culture, religious structure would have responded to his decision uh, not to go through with this and say, I have a different understanding of God now. Can you imagine what happens when you do something like that? Uh, you are called a heretic. Uh, we've burnt people at the stake for less than changing the name of God that comes along with an evolving understanding of the divine. This mythology of Abraham and Isaac is often erroneously used to explain what Jesus does on the cross for us. 
how Jesus dies in our place like the lamb dies in the place of Isaac in the story. This is called the penal substitutionary theory of the, ent- uh, the atonement. Otherwise, uh, it, is, it is someone uh, taking the, uh, uh, the punishment that someone else should get. In other words, uh, we say that uh, uh, instead of us being punished for our sins, Jesus took that on himself. But this idea that is so prevalent in Christianity denies the further evolutionary process of the story. It's as if the the Bible stops uh, in Genesis. Uh, There is another 65 books to go. And we see that tiny evolution in this one story, but the evolutionary process continues uh, about the, the, uh, the very idea of God. Uh, This idea that uh, uh, this is a metaphor for what Jesus does on the cross denies the fact that the story goes on. People's understanding continues to evolve. That evolutionary process leads us uh, to the prophet Micah eventually, where we hear the words, With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings? With calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with a thousand rams, with ten thousand rivers of olive oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Micah's response to those questions God has shown you, O mortal. What is good? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. All that is required of us is not sacrifices. All that is required of us is that we live in Christ, that we live lives that are based on his life that we live kingdom lives, to act justly, to love mercy and to walk humbly. And when we fail to do that, which we inevitably do, there is not a sacrifice required, just a change, that we change the way we live, that we reorient our lives. That is what is required. So before we judge Abraham too harshly, we need to firstly examine our own lives. How do we sacrifice the vulnerable, the voiceless, the marginalised, and especially children? Do we sacrifice our children on the altars of unrealistic expectations or perhaps an abusive education system? Do we stand by silently while the Biloela kids are imprisoned on Christmas Island, sacrificed on the altar of the cult of nationalism by the high priest of border protection? Most of us are wearing clothes that are made somehow or other, at least the cotton in them is sourced uh, from child labour or manufactured in in sweatshops where over 170 million children in the world are forced into child labour? Do we know the supply chain history of what we are wearing, of what we are eating, the chocolate we enjoy, the coffee we drink? Chances are we are all in some way contributing to child labour, to child sacrifice. The New South Wales Modern Slavery Bill of 2018 is still to be passed by our parliament. And we can only imagine the pressure from big business, those huge businesses, those well-known brands who have child labour in their supply chains. We can only imagine the pressure that those businesses are putting on politicians 
to make this bill go away. That's why it's taken over two years for it still not to be passed. We here in the Diocese of Newcastle stand resolutely against all forms of child abuse and yet we continue to live in and benefit from a society where 80% of such abuse continues to happen in the family home by a trusted adult. And we dare to judge Abraham, who at the end of the day stood against his entire society, his culture and even his God to engage in a new way, a better way. If only we could be so courageous. He was truly a prophet. Would we have the courage and the faith to welcome such a prophet into our homes, into our lives? Would we have the courage and faith to welcome such a message into our homes and into our lives? Jesus' death on the cross is not a sacrifice to assuage the wrath of an angry God. Jesus' death on the cross is the consequences of standing resolutely and non-violently against a system that sacrifices the vulnerable. If only we could truly and deeply follow him. The biblical narrative is an evolutionary process and it doesn't end with the last full stop at the end of the last chapter of the book of Revelation. We are its ensuing books. We are its ensuing chapters. And we must ask the question, how will our descendants read and interpret the stories of our lives. The Lord be with you.